This is what we get when we combine the power of a 16 megapixel professional digital compact with the intelligence of Android 4.1 Jelly Bean and a powerful 1.4 gigahertz quad core processor. So as well as a professional quality camera that fits in your pocket, you can call on all kinds of handy apps to help you shoot and edit great shots and then upload and enjoy them from wherever you are in the world. Welcome to IFTI's Tech Corner, where today we're looking at the Samsung Galaxy Camera. Now we all know that Samsung are a big name in cameras, and they're an even bigger name in Android devices. Bringing the two together was the next logical step, and the result is this Samsung Galaxy camera. This isn't the first camera that runs Android, that was the Nikon Coolpix S800C, neither is it the first to run downloaded applications as the Sony Alpha NEX 5R did that too. It's the first Android camera from a big name in tablets and phones however, and that's what makes this interesting. The Samsung Galaxy camera is available now for around £400, which equates to around $650. So let's take a look and see what's inside the box here. If we take away the top of the box, we're greeted with the actual camera unit itself. We'll take a look at that in just a second. And underneath a flap at the bottom here, we have a quick start guide. We have a micro USB to USB charging cable. We have a plug adapter, so we just pull this part up from here and attach the adapter of your actual country straight into the bottom. We have a small wrist strap and the actual battery itself. This is a 1650 milliamp battery, so it should give us some decent battery life. The Galaxy camera is a pretty attractive device. It shares a lot of design DNA with Samsung's regular cameras like the equally attractive WB150. And apart from its enormous 4.8 inch screen on the back, it doesn't look markedly different from anything already on the market. It's very wide compared to a regular point and shoot, though measuring over five inches across, a figure that can largely be linked to the size of the screen on the back. At a shade under 3 inches is not particularly tall, but it's quite thick at 0.75 inches across, not including the lens and the hand grip. Its optically stabilised 23mm f2.8-2.9 lens almost doubles the overall thickness, even when closed and when fully extended, it's about 3 inches long. Because of the lightweight body and the huge lens, when you fully extend the zoom or at around the 7.5 times zoom, the camera is probably likely to topple forward. So you can't just balance it on your table or balance it on something to take a shot. You really do need to use a tripod. Aside from the glass on the screen and the actual lens, the Galaxy camera is all plastic, but it feels well put together and sturdy and the lightweight construction makes one-handed operation feasible, if not ideal. The built-in hand grip is a little too shallow for my tastes. Although it's covered in a soft grip, soft touch plastic, the material ends well before the grip joins the rear of the camera. The edging around the hand grip, which snakes to meet the rear display, is quite pretty and does a good job of separating the front and back sections of the camera. Decked out in all white plastic, there's also a black edition available, although I personally find the white more striking overall. The Galaxy camera certainly catches the eye since Samsung has kept the design and button layout very minimal. Nevertheless, the overall look and feel of the camera is promising, a nice grip and an almost standard point and shoot design and feel overall. With very few buttons across the entire unit, it's clear most functions are accessed around the large touchscreen display on the back of the device. Let's take a more detailed look around the camera. Okay, so taking a look at the front of the camera, we have the rubberized grip, the autofocus sensor here next to the Samsung logo, and the actual lens itself. Now the lens is a 16.3 megapixel backside illuminated CMOS sensor that outputs 4608 by 3456 pixel images and records in 1080p high definition. It's also been engineered to draw less power overall. 
On top of this, the lens supports a 21 times zoom, equivalent to 23 to 483 millimeters on a conventional 35 millimeter camera, which can be controlled by the dial at the top or the touchscreen display on the rear. That firmly puts this camera into the realm of super zooms. A 16 megapixel sensor may sound impressive, but sensor size is far more important than megapixel count. The Galaxy camera sensor is a 1 by 2.3 inch unit, and although it's backlit, which helps image quality overall, it's very small. You'll find bigger and better sensors in every camera in this price range, and the cheaper high-end point-and-shoots like Canon's high-end S100 have larger 1 by 1.73 inch sensors. In fact, Samsung's sensor is only marginally larger than one in the Nokia Lumia 920, and it's dwarfed by that of another Nokia phone, the 808 PureView. Now on the top of the device, we find three of the four mechanical buttons on the entire device. A standby button and a two-stage shutter key along with the zoom toggle. The zoom can also be accessed on the touchscreen itself. We also find a built-in microphone on the top. Bear in mind, we have no other external microphone options with this unit. So this built-in mic is the best when it comes, when it comes to video recording. The final button is a side-mounted mechanical key that pops up the built-in Xenon flash. The flash will not pop up automatically, as in when you need it, which you would expect from a camera of this caliber, and to be honest, it does feel a little cheap. But its nice Xenon flash illuminates the subject evenly and consistently. One nice thing about this system is you won't ever have the flash fire when you don't want it to. The camera software is unable to trigger the flash, unless you've already popped it up yourself. Also on this side, we have a pretty decent speaker, which gives fair quality sound when playing back video or when playing games and using apps. Remember, this isn't just a camera. On the opposite side, we have a standard 3.5 millimeter headphone port and a small flap, which hides the micro USB port used for charging the battery. Bear in mind, unlike many other point and shoots on the market, you do not get a separate battery charger. So the battery needs to be charged while it's actually in the unit. Also on this side, we have a small metal section here for attaching the included wrist strap. On the bottom of the unit, we have a standard tripod mount along with a sliding door, which opens up to reveal space for the removable 1650 milliamp battery, which thankfully stays placed even when the door is opened with this little clip here. Now we also have a micro SIM slot, a micro HDMI port, and space here for your micro SD card. The lack of full SD cards will disappoint many, but the Galaxy camera does come with 10 gigs of total storage on board the unit. Six gigs are taken up by the operating system, which gives us four gigs of usable onboard storage. And that's still good for around 1,016 megapixel photos. And micro SD cards can nowadays be purchased for next to nothing anyway. Also note that the HDMI port is accessible even when the door is closed by lifting a small flap on the rear of the unit. A convenient little addition. Now the camera is pretty sparse overall, but that's because Samsung want you to use the touch screen for almost every task. And about the screen, it's gorgeous. It's easily the best screen I've seen on a camera. At 4.8 inches, the 720p LCD has fantastic viewing angles and color reproduction, in my opinion, is better than the Samsung has ever put on a phone. Touch response is on par with the best smartphones, but I can't help but feel that the Galaxy camera would have been better served by a slightly smaller display. I find enormous smartphones difficult to use, especially with one hand, and the same is true here. A slightly smaller screen would have certainly helped with pocketability as well. Samsung's first attempt at connected camera software isn't perfect. While its Android 4.1 base suite is full of good ideas, there's just too much excess baggage. Starting up the Galaxy camera for the first time brings up Android's regular setup screen, prompting you to connect to a Wi-Fi network and sign in or set up your Google account. Next, you'll be asked if you want to sign up for or sign into Dropbox, where a bonus 48 gigs of extra cloud storage, which is free for two years, is waiting for you. This offer will be familiar to anyone with a Galaxy, Galaxy S3 or Galaxy Note, but on a dedicated camera, it's a real game changer. 
If you've ever used Dropbox for Android before, nothing has changed. Once you sign in with your account, you'll be given the option to enable automatic uploads. And once you do so, every photo you take will be stored in the cloud. The camera will still keep a copy of your images locally, so it's up to you to decide what you want to keep or delete. When you wake it from sleep, the Galaxy camera immediately launches into its camera app with the last settings you've enabled. We have three main modes to choose from. In auto, as with any camera, the software will monitor your scene and adjust the ISO, shutter speed, aperture and white balance to capture what it thinks is the best picture available. Another tap brings up smart mode, which offers access to a number of options like continuous shooting, smile detection, action, landscape, beauty face, which will apparently remove your blemishes, and countless others. None of the screens are revolutionary, but when compared to the slow, text-heavy menus of most cameras, the Galaxy camera's bright and simple menus are a huge leap forward. In the Galaxy camera's final mode, Expert, things start to go a little south. The interface tries mimicking the real-life design of a lens barrel. Strawn across the panel are settings for shutter speed, aperture, ISO and exposure, while a final gauge displays a light meter. To change each setting, you simply swipe each setting up and down. The real issue here is speed. The lack of physical buttons, aside from a z single zoom toggle and shutter key, means that you're forced to tap and swipe far too many times just to change a couple of settings in between shots. It's really not practical and led me to abandon the expert mode for 90% of my photos. I assume that most people buy this camera won't venture outside of the simple modes, and Samsung has done a good job of making things easy. As long as you're not trying to do something too complex, using a touchscreen is simply more than intuitive than using buttons. In typical Samsung fashion, there are plenty of other innovative things going on inside the suite, including filters and voice commands, which, I kid you not, let you shout at the camera to zoom in or out and even say cheese to trigger the shutter. These worked more often than not, but weren't anywhere near reliable enough to use after the novelty wore off. The built-in lens produces fairly soft images and the dynamic range is pretty poor when compared to other cameras in this price range. Like many ultra zoom lenses, when you're zoomed in all the way, you'll find the picture is slightly distorted. The center of the image will either bulge in or out. It's not terrible, but many cameras have algorithms to automatically correct the distortion, which makes the mission here a little disappointing. The lens and sensor combo also results in a large depth of field. Blurring out the unnecessary parts of your composition gives the entire image more depth and reality, and it's sorely missed here. Another thing that other cameras handle better is white balance, especially under incandescent light, the sort that regular bulbs produce. My images took on a very yellow tinge when I shot in auto or smart mode. ISO performance fares a little better, it ranges from ISO 100 to ISO 3200 in doubling steps, and retains a decent amount of detail all the way up to the maximum setting. Of course, you start to lose the finer details as you increase the ISO, particularly in poor lit scenes, but your images will certainly be good enough for sharing. The zoom itself, distortion aside, is smooth and the fairly fast optical image stabilization system does a good job at keeping the camera steady and your images blur free. The most notable difference between Galaxy camera and other point and shoots is the all round speed of operation. Launching the camera from standby generally takes a couple of seconds which is better than cheap point and shoots, which don't have a standby mode as such, but it's still slightly slower than many smartphones and mid-range cameras. Shutter lag is virtually non-existent, and you'll be able to capture about a shot every two seconds, including refocusing. One final matter of contention, sometimes powering on the camera from standby mode results in a lengthy four to five second wait for it to unlock. Apart from that, the device is incredibly snappy and given the intermittent nature of the fault, hopefully that's something Samsung can sort with an updated firmware. Overall, the camera offers good performance for most amateur photographers, but the professional users will be left slightly disappointed. Overall, I found the Galaxy camera's video capabilities to be pretty impressive and it seems to benefit immensely from its optical image stabilization. In auto mode, it can capture 1080p or 720p video at 30 frames per second, and saves them as MP4 files encoded with a H.264 codec. But if you're planning on shooting a lot of video, you'll want to invest in a micro SD card. There's not enough space in the internal memory for even an hour of 1080p video. 
Jumping into expert mode would provide you with far more extensive range of video options, along with white balance and exposure changes that you won't be able to access in other modes. Video aside, the Samsung Galaxy camera performs like an average point and shoot. If you've dropped a couple of hundred pounds or dollars on a camera in the past year, it's unlikely to be a step up in quality from what you're used to. It certainly outperforms the current crop of smartphones in image quality, except for a few cases. In addition to Dropbox integration, the Galaxy camera has a number of built-in apps for you to choose from, as well as access to the entire Google Play Store. It's pretty much like a full-on Galaxy S3. Menus are smooth to navigate and the entire end-user experience is a pleasant one. A huge benefit Android has over proprietary OSs of the camera is editing. While many cameras have some basic retouching features, there aren't many that have access to the sort of photo and video modification apps you can find in the Play Store. Indeed, the first time you turn on the camera, you'll see a pair of Samsung approved photo and video apps waiting for you. The Photo Wizard app offers virtually everything you'd want from a touch-based editor, but the video editor app, terrible themes aside, is completely forgettable. Luckily, there are some more robust options in the Play Store that you can combine to get decent on-device experience. Once you're happy with your modified image or video, a quick tap of an on-screen button will let you share it with any app or service you want, including Dropbox. There's been a small amount of confusion around what exactly this product can and can't do with its micro SIM, but it definitely can't make cellular calls out of the box. If you're really set on using the Galaxy camera as a makeshift phone, you could always download a voice over IP app. Skype calls worked just fine through the regular Android app, but I was stuck in speakerphone mode. There's no earpiece to speak of. Likewise, although I was able to see friends just fine while attempting video calls, there's no secondary camera, so I was stuck sharing a view of the wall behind my desk. Talking of sharing, you'll also be able to broadcast live video on the go with apps like Livestream, as you can with virtually any Android device, which is a nice feature. This always connected world definitely has its downsides though. If you have another Android device already, you may find that when you first signed into the Galaxy camera, it imports all of your apps and media into the device. That meant I not only had a lot of unwanted apps wasting storage space, but was also inundated by Google Talk messages, emails, calendar, events, and other miscellaneous reminders. Of course, I was able to switch off all notifications without too much trouble. Samsung has even included a blocking mode specifically for this purpose, but with so many Android users out there, not all of them as technically proficient, it's likely to irritate a lot of people. Bearing in mind we have a quad-core beast hiding in this camera, which enables the user to play some pretty graphically demanding games as well as more popular titles like Angry Birds, the overall experience is similar, if not the same, as a full-on Android cellular device, such as the Galaxy S3, just without the built-in phone. Samsung says the battery life is good for 7 hours or so of continuous use, or 340 shots. That's not bad for a point and shoot. However, unlike your average camera, Samsung Galaxy camera doesn't really switch off as a standard and it'll continue to go about its business, downloading your emails, uploading photos and videos until you turn it on again or it runs out of battery. The result is a pretty poor out of the box experience as you'll find the battery dies usually within a few days in standby. Samsung obviously knew this would be an issue and has a smart network mode that switches off wireless connectivity whenever the screen is off. With that setting enabled, the camera lasts for at least a week on standby. That's a lot more acceptable, but if, like me, you're used to leaving your camera in a bag for weeks on end, you'll need to start remembering to power it all the way down when you're finished using it. Apart from enabling the power saving options by default, or at least managing background data more efficiently, I'm not sure what Samsung could have done differently here, if you want a camera as smart as this, it has to come at the expense of battery life. Whether this is a camera with tablet features or a tablet with a decent camera strapped to the back will depend very much on how you choose to use it. The camera itself is good, it's not the best you could buy for the money, particularly not now the excellent Samsung EX2F is getting cheaper, but as a package, this is the best of the two Android cameras currently available. Buying a better dedicated non-Android camera would mean you'd miss out on the most compelling features here. 
In that respect, the Galaxy camera is a unique proposition and one that's easy to recommend. It already feels mature and stable and with some fantastic sharing and editing features, it's an all round excellent solution. However, is it worth the extra premium you pay considering its extra features? Probably not, especially if you have a smartphone with a capable camera already. So what do you think of Samsung's Galaxy camera? Leave a comment below. Remember to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.